So turn to Revelation 14. Um, there's Bibles over here if you want to grab a Bible or somebody want to grab you one, David? David, okay. Um, the first part of this chapter is what we're going to look at this morning, and it's a, an amazing contrast between the dark and ugly things that we saw in chapter 13, which will be the darkest time this world has ever seen uh, and will ever experience. We saw the rise of the Antichrist in chapter 13 and his right-hand man, the false prophet. Uh, they will deceive the world, many people in this world, into worshiping Satan himself. They will use lying signs and wonders to uh, you know, get people to reject Jesus and follow the Antichrist. Uh, they will rule with an iron fist. We're told that whoever doesn't follow the Antichrist, worship his image, will be put to death. This image uh, will be put in the, the rebuilt temple there in Jerusalem, and uh, it's an image of the beast or the Antichrist. Uh, we saw at the end of chapter 13 that everyone in the world at some point during the Great Tribulation will be forced to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead, and that mark will identify the people as followers of the Antichrist. And it's a, a, an identification mark that will replace all cash, all currency, all credit cards. It'll be a mark that will replace all passports and the need for a driver's license. Everything will be on this, I believe, some type of a, a computer ID chip and it will link to a central computer system run by the Antichrist and everybody will be required to have it or you cannot buy or sell anything. And we saw at the, the last verse in chapter uh, 13 that the number of the beast is 666. That's where you get that uh, crazy number. And, and so somehow this is all ties into worshiping the Antichrist. He will promise the people, if you take the mark, you will be fed. Because again, things are going to be very scarce during the Great Tribulation. You will be able to, um, you know, again, buy, sell. Uh, he's going to promise peace. He's going to promise safety and protection. Um, he's going to unite everyone under this worship of the Antichrist, which essentially is worship of Satan. I mean, that's Satan is the one who is empowered this antichrist he has given him all of his authority we're told uh, he will implement a one world government a one world economy and again a one world religion where everybody will worship the antichrist if you don't then you will be put to death um, as we'll see later on in chapter 14 whoever takes this id mark of the antichrist will have no chance of going to heaven it seals their fate with the mark of the beast tattooed on them somehow, whatever that chip is, they will be thrown into the lake of fire that burns forever and ever. So dark days ahead for those who are alive during the Great Tribulation. Now, even though we're in the worst time of apostasy and rebellion against God, during this time of God's wrath, where he pours out his judgment on this world, on the inhabitants of this world, God always has a witness. He always has one or more to testify of his goodness, his grace, his forgiveness, his salvation. He always has a witness. And you can look at this throughout the, the, the Bible, you know, starting in Genesis. I mean, God told the very first time in Genesis 3.15, when, after Adam and Eve sinned, that there was going to be one who would crush the serpent's head, the born of the seed of the woman which is a reference to the virgin birth. We see this throughout the, the Old Testament, though God gives people an opportunity to believe his word. He had a sacrificial system that was looking forward to the Lamb of God, Jesus, that takes away the sin of the world. So he always has a witness, a test to, uh, somebody to testify of who he is and the truth of who he is. Now, we saw this in chapter 11, where God raises up these two prophets, I believe Moses and Elijah, and they will be there at the base of the Temple Mount, probably by the Western Wall, and they will be calling people to repentance. Don't take the mark of the beast. Don't believe in the Antichrist. Turn to Jesus. Well, we're told that after 1,000, well, 1,260 days, the first three and a half years of the Great Tribulation, they will be put to death, and then on day 1,000, 
uh, 264. I think they're dead for three days, three and a half days, and God will raise them up, and all the world will see them raise up. But God will also, as we saw in chapter 7, use 144,000 Jews, men, Jewish men, from each of the 12 tribes, 12,000 from each 12 tribes, 144,000, and they will be like, you know, the Apostle Paul's running all over the world, proclaiming the gospel to the people on the earth. And so God always has a witness. And we'll see another witness mentioned at the end of this message here in a little bit. But God doesn't desire for any to perish. Uh, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John three seventeen that you see in the screen, the very next verse says, For God did not send his son into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's what it's all about. God wants to save people. He gives people an opportunity to know him. So chapter 14, verse 1, it says, Then I looked, and this is the apostle John, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And so again, we're reintroduced to this large group of witnesses, 144,000. We saw them back in chapter 7, and here we see them once again. And they have the seal of God upon their foreheads. We see that in chapter 7. Here it says the name of that seal is God's name, the Father's name. Uh, what exactly is that? We don't know for sure. But he has this name upon their foreheads. Is it the Tetragrammaton, you know, Y-H-W-H, that we say Yahweh? Uh, we, we don't know. Possibly. But they have this mark upon their foreheads. It's the seal of God. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Here we see them standing on Mount Zion with the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And what I see this as a preview to the second coming of Christ. Because when Jesus returns at a second coming, he puts his feet down on the Mount of Olives. It splits in two. He goes into uh, or onto the Temple Mount. And here we see that's Mount Zion. And here he we see the 144,000 gathered around him. And so this is what's going to happen when he returns at his second coming. So we're told they preach the gospel all over the world, and that seal upon their foreheads has worked. Take note of that. This seal has, has done its job. Every single one of these Jewish followers of Jesus makes it through the Great Tribulation victoriously. This is awesome because, remember, these guys are still in their human bodies. They haven't received a resurrection body, but they have the power of the Holy Spirit working in them and through them, and they are invincible. Satan can't come against them. The demons can't harm them. In fact, they're the only ones that are not harmed. Remember the demons that were let loose in chapter 9? It says they tormented everybody on planet Earth for 150 days except those who had the seal of God on their foreheads. So they're the only ones that are protected during this time. But what we do know is that seal of God upon our foreheads is the guarantee that every one of us who are saved by Jesus Christ will make it to heaven. We will live with Jesus in glory if you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. They have a seal of God on their foreheads, but we have the Holy Spirit. He's called the guarantee or the seal of God which, if you're born again, that means you will make it to heaven guaranteed. If you're not born again, if you're a make-believer, only God knows your heart. I don't know your heart. But there'll be those that say, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name, perform all these signs and wonders in your name? And he'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So that, again, there's a fine line between a professing believer who just says the right things, but they're not born again, and a possessing believer they can backslide. They might, you know, fade away for a while, but they always come back because they are a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. But we are sealed. We're guaranteed eternal life because of that seal of the Holy Spirit. Those who take the mark of the beast are guaranteed eternal damnation in the lake of fire. And we'll see more of that later on. But Ephesians chapter 1, this is one of the key verses. Chapter 1, verse 13 in Ephesians says, In Him, that's in Christ, 
you also trusted. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So you had to do your part, which is simply believe. Faith alone in Christ alone is why you're saved. Not by any good works you can do, lest anyone should boast. But you have to believe. And here it says, In whom also, having believed, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the day of redemption, or until the redemption of the purchased possession, to the praise of His glory. And so, again, that, that seal of the Holy Spirit upon our lives is powerful. I mean, this is why you should have great confidence in knowing when you, where you're going to go when you die. You know where you're going because you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. If it was left up to me to secure my own salvation, if it was left, left up to me to try to maintain my salvation, I would fail miserably. I cannot save myself. I cannot keep myself saved. You have to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. And he gives us that guarantee that he will save us. Praise the Lord for his saving grace, his sustaining power. Philippians 1.6 tells us this, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So he'll do it. He started this process in my life. He will fulfill it. I am justified in Christ. He sees me just as if I'd never sinned, but I'm still in the sanctification process. So when I look in the mirror, I'm like, really, Lord? You saved me? I don't know why. I'm a, I'm a doofus. I stumble and bumble. But no, I've been justified. I'm being sanctified. Ultimately, we'll be glorified. It's all his doing. So again, this does not mean that we will never go through difficult days uh, times of trial and testing, but it does mean that we are safe and secure in the hand of God and that Jesus will never leave us, he'll never forsake us, and that when my time and your time is up, we will go to be with the Lord in glory. Now, one of the first things we see here, and one of the reasons I like this verse so much, is that the Lamb, Jesus Christ, it says, is standing on Mount Zion with every single one of the 144,000. It doesn't say there's 143,990. It doesn't say there's 143,999. He didn't lose one. They're all safe. They're all accounted for. 144,000 standing there with the Lamb. Not one was lost. Not one is missing in action. Not one is unaccounted for. They all made it through the Great Tribulation victoriously. Hallelujah but it was only because of the Lord. That's true, though, for you and me as well. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've, you've placed your faith and trust in Him alone, then your place in heaven is reserved. It's an inheritance that you have in Christ. He paid the price. He did everything for your salvation. This is one of my favorite verses. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verses 3 through 5, it says it like this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time or in the last days. I quote this verse at every funeral I do for a believer because this is our living hope. You know, we have that living hope, as Peter says here, and it's based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He has prepared a place for us. He's reserved a place for us. It's the guarantee of our inheritance that we have a place in glory, waiting for us when we die. I let people know when I do a funeral, this is not some wishy-washy kind of hope. It's a living hope. Paul calls it a blessed hope. It's not thinking, well, I hope there's a heaven. I hope Jesus is real. I hope he's got a place up there for me. No, this is a genuine fact. This is a living hope 
that Jesus is preparing a place for me. And he tells us that in uh, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. That is a promise. It's not on the screen. It just came out of my brain. So, <laughs> uh, it, it's so true. God has given us that glorious inheritance. And I'm looking forward to seeing him face to face. Now look at verse 2. It says, And I heard John speaking again, and I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne. Again, these angels with the harps, and these that are before him, the four living creatures, and the elders who represent the church, and no one can learn that song except the 144,000 who are redeemed from the earth. So this is an amazing scene here. We see a lot of singing going on in the book of Revelation. A lot of worship takes place. In chapter 4 and 5, we saw the church, the bride of Christ, worshiping the Lord, praising Him for delivering us from out of the great tribulation time. We see uh, in chapter 7, later on in that chapter 7, because of the witness of the 144,000, we see all these tribulation saints that get saved during that time. And they have a different song that they sing to the Lord. And so there's a lot of worship taking place. In chapter 15, we'll see more saints who are killed by the Antichrist. And it says they sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Two different song, songs, but what's the song of Moses? Remember when they passed through the Red Sea, and they're on the other side, God had closed the waters on the uh, Pharaoh's army, and they just begin to sing and worship the Lord. Miriam is the one that leads them in this worship celebration, and you know the horse and the rider will be thrown into the sea, and it's a song of victory that God delivered us from the enemy, that God brought us through safely, and so we'll see that song and it's attributed to these tribulation saints worshiping the Lord. Now, they're going to praise the Lord. They're going to be worshiping Jesus on earth, while at the same time, they're being accompanied by these angels in heaven. When you go through the commentaries, it's amazing. Everybody's different. Everybody looks at it different. Half of them will say, this is all taking place in heaven, Zion. And then half of them will say, no, this is on earth. Everything's on earth because Mount Zion and all the verses dealing with Mount Zion is on earth. And we're told, do you have that verse about Mount Zion? Or did I skip it already? I think I skipped it. Psalm 2, verse 6. You got to go back. I skipped right over that. Psalm 2, verse 6 uh, says, God says of his Messiah, Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I know, I, I blew right by it, sorry. <laughs> but it's uh, his holy hill is Zion. But we also know there's a heavenly Zion. And so this, I think it's both. You know, Jesus and the 144,000 on Mount Zion, worshiping the Lord, being accompanied by angels in heaven. Why not? It's going to be awesome. Don't quote me on that. God can always prove me wrong later on. But, you know, we need to worship the Lord. God's throne room of grace is open to us always. Psalm 142. Here's examples from David. King David knew this for himself very well. He, he says, I cry out to the Lord with my voice. With my voice to the Lord, I make my supplication. I pour out my complaint before him. I declare before him my trouble. God wants to hear from us. Pour out your complaint before him. Yeah, there's things you don't know. You, you question. You're complaining. Don't grumble and complain to everybody else or me. Take it to the Lord. You know, He loves to hear from you. And you can just speak from your heart because He already knows what's in your heart and He wants you to pour out complaints. He says, I'll declare before Him my trouble. God wants to hear from us. Psalm 5. This is a song we used to sing when I first got saved back in the 70s. Give ear to my words. This is Psalm 5, verses 1 through 3. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For I, 
Uh, for to you I will pray, my voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you. I will look up. And all of us as believers need to look up. We need to keep our focus on the Lord, keep calling out to Him, because He does love us. He does care for us. In Colossians 3, it's not on the screen, but read Colossians 3, 1-3. through 3. That's where Paul says, set your mind on things above where Christ is. Not on things of the earth, because there's so much in this world that's going to try to consume your thought life. So we've got to set our minds on things above where Christ is. And we've been, it says we died and our lives are hidden with God in Christ Jesus. So don't get caught up in all the stuff of this world. Keep looking to Jesus Christ. And it's amazing that even though we are down here on earth, we have access to the very throne room of God's grace. And all you ladies are going through Hebrews. That's what Hebrews 4.16 is all about, you know. It's God's grace. His throne room of grace is open to all of us. Well, look at verse 4. They're singing this new song, and then it says, These are the ones, speaking of the 144,000, who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. This description is powerful, and through this we find, I think, five amazing statements in these two verses that make these 144,000 very unique, but very usable for the kingdom of God. And these we need to apply to ourselves. We're gonna, this is the gist of the message is right here. Because being able to apply these things to our own lives makes us very unique in this world. Very usable for the kingdom of God today. First of all, we're going to go through these five things. Some have seen more, but look at this. First of all, it says, They were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. I could get in a lot of trouble by talking about this they're not defiled with women doesn't mean women are defiling that's not what it's talking about so be careful here but it just simply means 144,000 are going to be morally pure before God now it told, tells us in Hebrews 13 verse 4 marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled but fornicators and adulterers God will judge the point is, as Christians, whether you're married or whether you're single, we are to be sexually pure before the Lord. There is no place for adultery or fornication or pornography or any list there. And you can look them up in Leviticus 17 and 19. There's a whole bunch of stuff. God says this is sexual immorality. And there's some nasty stuff in there. But I'm not going to go into all the details, but you want to be used by God, then keep yourself sexually pure. As a Christian, we want to be an asset for the kingdom of God. We don't want to be a liability. I've seen people over the years get caught up in sexual sin as believers, and it's like they put the basket over their light. They're still saved. Well, I think they're still saved. Only God knows for sure. Because they'll often, if they're truly born again, they will repent. They'll come back to the Lord. Nobody's perfect. We still stumble. We still bumble around. Lonnie Frisbee, who's in the movie, you know, Jesus Revolution, God used him in the beginning, but then he went off the rails later on. Greg Laurie and then my pastor, Mike McIntosh, were at his deathbed, at his deathbed when he was 43 years old, dying of AIDS. And, and they said, you can repent, Lonnie. God still loves you. And he supposedly, according to what Mike and Greg said, he repented, gave his life back to the Lord. But there's always consequences to your actions. These guys, they were known for being pure, living a pure, holy life before the Lord. But if you mock God, the Bible's very clear. God is not mocked. A man will reap what he sows. You reap to the flesh, you will, if you sow to the flesh, you'll reap corruption. And so, what's the solution? Well, look at the second thing mentioned here in verse um, 4. It says, not only are they not defiled with women, they're virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb 
wherever he goes. Now, that should be pretty obvious to all of us as Christians. The term Christian was a negative term when it was first coined by the Romans against the Christians. It was in Antioch. They started calling them, Paul and his followers, Christians. It was a mocking term. Oh, you little Jesus freak. Christian means a little follower of Christ. They began to take that as a badge of honor. Yes, I am a little follower of Christ. And so that's what he says here. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. There's no one better to follow than Jesus Christ, our chief shepherd. He's not only the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, but he is our shepherd and he loves us. He cares for us. He takes us along the, the streams of still water, the green pastures. He protects us. He watches over us 24-7. Jesus tells us in John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. So why, again, why would we follow anyone else? He leads us, He guides us. How, do, how does He lead us? Through the Word of God. Uh, in this Jesus Revolution movie, um, my sister saw it, and so I, I was able to get up to speed on it. How did it end? Because Lonnie was only there. He was 18 years old when he shows up at Chuck's house. That guy that plays Lonnie in real life is like 40-something <laughs> Uh, Chuck was like 42, Kelsey Grammer, and like he's 67 today. So be that as it may, Lonnie shows up 18 years old, 19, 20. By the time he's 21, he ended up getting into extra biblical things, charismania, trying to slay people in the spirit. And, and uh, Chuck says, no, we work within the parameters of God's word. If you go outside the parameters of God's word, then you're opening up Pandora's box, so to speak. Then you can attribute all kinds of weird stuff to the Holy Spirit. So that's when he parted. God used Lonnie in, in tremendous ways. But we have to always come back to the Word of God. When Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, we need to be hearing what the Word of God says. By believing, by obeying the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. God doesn't say, okay, here's my Word, now you're on your own. Because then you end up being legalistic. That's how Chuck kind of was before the Jesus revolution. You got to live this way. You got to do these things. No, it's the Holy Spirit of God that takes the word of God that transforms the people of God. I can't obey God's word in my own strength. I would stumble and bumble and fail every time. That's why he's given us the comforter, another one, just like Jesus to dwell within us. It's the Holy Spirit that's in us. that gives us the strength, the ability to live out what he's called us to do. And so that's first and foremost. If we're going to follow him wherever he goes, it's according to the word of God in the power of the Holy Spirit. We'll hear Jesus speak words of comfort, of encouragement, of strength. We'll hear him exhort us. We'll hear him challenge us. We will hear him speak words of compassion and love, as well as words of rebuke. And warning, because there's a lot of warnings in God's word. But he also speaks of forgiveness, and it's all based on his grace. Only Jesus knows exactly what you need at any given moment. So we have this relationship with him. So we follow the lamb wherever he goes. The third thing that will keep us usable, and to always remember... Look at the third thing here. It's mentioned at the, the end of verse 4. These were redeemed from among men. They were redeemed. In other words, just like us, they were bought with a price. That's what redeemed means. You were bought with a price, the blood of Jesus. That's the only acceptable payment for your sins. You cannot work your way to heaven. You cannot deserve or earn or do anything. To merit salvation, you have to be bought with a price. And again, we simply put our faith in Christ alone because He alone is worthy to be, you know, to follow, to worship, to lay our lives down before. First Peter chapter one, 
starting in verse 18. It says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct, your, you know, dead works, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Again, the only acceptable payment to cleanse you and remove all your sins was the blood of Jesus. You can't add to that. You can't take away from that. It's simply believing and receiving His forgiveness. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You can tie that back with, you know, uh, being sexually pure before the Lord. For you were bought at a price, again, the blood of Jesus. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's or which belongs to God. So if you want to be usable for the kingdom of God as a Christian, your life does not belong to yourself. You were bought with a price. This is why Jesus says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow Jesus. Luke 9.23 So, Jesus bought our broken, sinful, useless, rebellious, perverted lives, not because we deserve salvation, not because we were so cute and cuddly and Jesus just had to have us. Not at all. We were doomed, we were damned, but by His grace and by His love, He saved us. The fourth attribute we see here in verse 5. 144,000, they were usable for the kingdom of God, and we can be too, because it says, And in their mouth was found no deceit or falsehood. Again, we got to use our mouth, our tongues, to build up people around us, to preach the good news of Jesus to those around us, not to tear people down, not to make fun of people, not to speak words that are false because there's no deceit in their mouths. We want to speak words of truth and honesty and righteousness. And that's what Paul says to the, the believers in Ephesians after he says, speak the truth in love. He then says this in Ephesians 4.29, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, because again, as believers, we can, if we get in the flesh, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, but by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, that's loud quarreling, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. That little phrase, even as God in Christ forgave you, that's how we are to forgive others. Even as means just as Jesus. Again, I can't do that. Not in my own strength. I don't have the ability to forgive anybody like Jesus forgives me completely unless you're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, unless you're walking in the love of Jesus Christ. I grew up in a home where all my dad can do, all he could do is speak words that tear you down. You're not good enough. You'll never be anything. He, he, he spoke words like this to my two sisters. I mean, it was horrible. He never said anything that would build anybody up. But he had no capacity, no capability. He was not saved. He didn't know God. He rejected the Lord. So it's sad that you can use your tongue, your mouth, to build up or tear down. As believers, filled with the Spirit, man, we should be excited. We should be joyful. We should be telling people, Jesus loves you. He died for you. That's how he demonstrated his own love toward you. And while you're still a sinner, Christ died for you. So we have good news to tell people. Even if you see a brother or sister stumble and fall, you can help build them back up. God doesn't abandon you. God still loves you. Even though you've rebelled against him, you wandered off. Be the prodigal son or daughter. Recognize the father will run out and greet you and receive you. And so often we just kick people while they're down. So be careful. 
So that's the fourth attribute. We want to build up, not tear down. We need our hearts to be refilled constantly with the Holy Spirit that brings the Word of God to life because, again, what's in your heart, Jesus says, will come out of your mouth. Out of the mouth uh, or out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So whatever you're putting into your heart, more of CNN, more of Fox News, <laughs> guess what's going to come out of your heart? Anger, bitterness, oh, Joe Biden, oh. Be careful. Be careful. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So that's the fourth thing. Look at the fifth thing here at the end of verse 5 that is unique to the 144,000 and again is vitally important for all of us as well. It says that they, and you can say, and we are without fault before the throne of God. In other words, everybody who follows the Lamb, Jesus Christ, is considered blameless and holy and righteous in the presence of God. Or to say it another way, whoever is in Christ, you have been declared holy and righteous and blameless, forgiven. That's how the Heavenly Father sees you. So that is our glorious position in Christ. We need to understand our position in Christ because it's not based on your feelings. It's not based on when you wake up and you're all discouraged and bummed out. You look in the mirror and I'm like, eh, I don't feel so holy and righteous and blameless today. I know what I did last night. That was not good, Lord. If you look at your circumstances moment by moment, you'll be discouraged. So by faith, you trust this is who I am in Christ. And that'll start to work in your heart and start coming out of your life. This is who I am in Jesus, a new creation in Christ. The old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. You realize that in that position that we have in Christ, he sees you as a new creation. He sees you. He receives you. He accepts you. Again, Ephesians chapter 1. I encourage people that are struggling in this area, read Ephesians 1 and 2, because that goes over and over again. Who you are in Christ. You are accepted in the beloved. You are forgiven of all of your sins. And sometimes you're like, I don't see how, Lord, because he sees Jesus in you. That's why you're accepted in the beloved. You're in Christ. So he sees Jesus. He doesn't see Jeff. He's not looking at me like, oh, Jeff blew it again, that jerk. No, he sees Jesus, and he knows I'm still in process. My position is a new creation. We're also in the sanctification process. I'm not perfect. Just ask Elizabeth. It'll take you like five seconds to realize, I'm not perfect, neither are you. But in Christ, we're a new creation. But we're in process. This is why we struggle in the here and now, because we have to learn to become more dependent on the Lamb of God, on our chief shepherd. Believe the word of God, not believe the things of this world. But it's an ongoing spiritual battle between our spirit that's alive in Christ and our old man that's still trying to pull us down. He has wrapped his robes of righteousness around us. We are clothed in Christ. The Bible says we are children of promise. And everything Jesus did for us was by his grace because of his amazing love for us. And this is an awesome truth that needs to resonate in all of our lives. Otherwise, the enemy is going to keep beating you down, making you feel like, yeah, I'm never going to make it. God couldn't love somebody like me. Well, of course he does. That's why Jesus came, to die for people just like you and me, sinners who need the Savior. It'll be so clear when we are standing before the Lord that it was all God. It wasn't us. His grace and his mercy is the reason why there's anything good in your life, anything good in my life, it's because of Jesus. Not because I worked something up or did something wonderful. It's only because of Jesus. And we should simply praise the Lord for his willingness to save us and change us and present us to the Father as blameless. So take note of that. That's a very important thing he says here, 
They are without fault before the throne of God. Again, that is your position right now. How do we know this is for you and me and not just 144,000? Because of Jude. Jesus' half-brother Jude wrote the book of Jude right before Revelation. And he is so blown away by this concept that the Lord's revealing to Jude. This is how he finishes his little letter, verses 24 and 25. Take note of this. He says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. He takes tremendous joy to say, Father, that knucklehead. No, he doesn't say knucklehead, Jeff. But Jeff is ours. He takes tremendous joy in saying that about you. He presents you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, because if it was left up to us, I'm not so wise. I would look around and say, these guys don't shouldn't go to heaven, God. And he's like, well, I didn't ask you to say who's going to heaven. I'm in charge of that. And so God knows. He's wise. To him alone who is wise be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. And so again, these five points, these five characteristics will not only be seen within the lives and actions of the 144,000 Jewish men during the seven years of the tribulation period, these should be evident within all of us. So look it over, check it out, study up on these things. There's so many verses that tie in with these facts. Now, again, we're going to wrap it up in a couple verses here. God always has a witness. Remember, he's always got a witness. Even in the Old Testament, he's always had a witness. Book of Judges, where everybody's doing what's right in their own eyes. God would raise up a deliverer, one of the judges, every time, because God always has a witness. 144,000, before that, the two prophets there. But check this out. I love this. Verses 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the Creator, the sea and springs of water. I wonder how many people are going to think this is some kind of a UFO or Chinese spy balloon and if our president will try to shoot this angel down. It's, just think about that. I mean, this angel, though, flying throughout the midst of heaven, it says mid-heaven is a literal term, and that means our atmosphere. He's flying around the whole earth proclaiming the everlasting gospel Again, which started in Genesis 3.15. You find it throughout the Old Testament. It's you know forgiveness because of the blood of Jesus, the Lamb. The Old Testament points to Jesus. We look back at the cross and what Jesus accomplished, the everlasting gospel. Good news that this angel is preaching to the world. This is going to be awesome. We're going to get to listen to this. Like billion watt speakers from this guy just circling the earth. Turn to Christ, repent, don't receive the mark of the beast. And he's going to tell everybody, to every tribe, tongue, nation, and people. I see this verse, verse 6, as a fulfillment of what Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 14. Remember, it's in verse 15 where he talks about the abomination of desolation. But here, he says in Matthew 24, 14, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, as a witness to the nations, and then the end will come. We're in the midst of the Great Tribulation. The end is almost here, and I think this angel is fulfilling that promise of Jesus. Now, there's a lot of great missionary organizations over the year that have used that verse to try to stir people up. We need to get the gospel out there to everybody, and that's true. But we're failing. More people are dying without Jesus today than ever. But this angel will fulfill what Jesus said. So it's a great motivation. Yeah, we need to be proclaiming the gospel, but the fulfillment of that will be here 
in the book of Revelation. Then the end comes. Some people say, well, Jesus can't come back until we Christianize the world. That's not going so well. The world's getting darker and darker, just like the Bible says. In the last days, men's hearts will go from bad to worse. It's not getting better. But when Jesus comes back, he will establish his kingdom, and then it'll be glorious. So I see that as the fulfillment. Notice what also this angel says here. Fear God and give glory to him. Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Now this fear of the Lord refers to that reverential awe, that reverential acknowledgement that God is supreme, that God is sovereign, that God is above everything and everybody because he is the creator of all things. And this fear of the Lord that this angel is proclaiming is a plea to the inhabitants of the earth, again, to repent of their sins, turn to this world's only hope, which is Jesus Christ, turn away from the Antichrist, trust the Lord. He is the creator, notice, of heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. We need to trust him alone. Stop believing the lies and the vain philosophies of men that say we just, you know, went from goo to you by way of the zoo. Evolution. That's what they say. We're here today because we went from goo in a swamp to you by way of the zoo. That's, I can't remember who said that initially, but it's true. That's what the world thinks. We've got science, we've got government, we've got inge you know, human ingenuity to take us to the next level of human potential. You know, I've brought up AI, that's a big thing, artificial intelligence. And now you get these guys, Elon Musk and Harari, both saying, yeah, we can live forever in the cloud. Just download people because they're going to tie in these computer chips into the brain and into the central system and you're not going to ever die you can have eternal life it's live from the enemy it's during the great tribulation time that all of mankind's efforts to make this world a utopia without god will be seen in all of its failures it'll come crashing down around them after all as this angel says here in verse 7 the hour of god's judgment has come and as the Bible tells us over and over again, when it comes to the final judgments of God, no one can stand in his way. Nothing can hinder God. There will be no hope for anyone unless they repent and they turn to Christ for salvation. Jesus is the only hope for this world. The early disciples understood this when they were standing before the Sanhedrin and they were threatened, stop speaking in the name of Jesus. You know, Peter said, we have to obey God rather than men. This is also what Peter said, Acts chapter 4, verse 12, speaking of Jesus. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Again, that name is Jesus. Remember when the angel shows up and Joseph is wanting to put his wife or his betrothed wife, not officially married, but put Mary away because she's found pregnant. The angel shows up and this is what he tells Joseph. Matthew 1, 20, 21. And she will bring forth a son. You shall call his name Jesus, Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. But again, to be saved, a person must not only believe that God exists, but they must acknowledge the fact that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation, that he died on the cross for your sins. He was buried in the tomb, but three days later he rose up victoriously because only a living Savior can give you living, eternal life, forever life. When a person receives Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, a radical change will take place in your life. You are forgiven of all your sins. You're declared righteous by God. You're adopted into the family of God. You've been accepted in the beloved. You're given eternal life. And I'll close with this. John 3.36 sums it up. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. For all of us who have received everlasting life, 
The natural response for, for a changed heart, it's seen here at the end of verse 7, we give glory to God and we worship Him because we know Him as Creator. He's the sustain, sustainer of our lives. He is with us always, even to the end of this age. He's the author and finisher of our faith. So three angels are going to cry out. This one has good news. The next two, not so good news. So we'll save that happy message for next time.